So good afternoon. Shalom. Yes, good to see everybody. Um, haven't been around too much for the last few months, as uh, you know, as you guys, are, most of you are aware. So it is. It's great to be back. Um, it's good to see so many people here. Don't see nearly as many people at our Saturday morning service. So it's nice to see them now. Um, I think we'll start by um, offering what I was asked to offer. This lovely place that we have here, as many of you know, uh, was originally a thought that came out of the Works Progress Administration in 1935. The ground was broken here in 1938, and it opened in 1940. I'm not sure how many of you were here in 1940, but probably not too many. But, um, you know, it opened as a school, a community, and a hospital, a self-contained haven, which in many ways it still is to this day for a developmentally disabled. And the people that we remember today have, were vibrant parts of that mission that we, we've shared. Marlene as a program supervisor, Patrick Rellis as a provider of direct care, and Michael Mark as a registered nurse providing direct care. As we share this uh, pandemic time together, this crisis, you know how it affects deeply all of us in so many ways. And one of the difficulties of this crisis is we have no absolute sense as to when this ends other than we know that God is there and, a, and as a support for us all. And um, as I remember other crises, I'm not thinking so much personal as ones we were all involved in, either as a nation or as, uh, or as the world, in my lifetime, how, uh, how I've coped. And, and I always remember somebody specific to that time that, I, that was lost, that I lost, or, or a very personal involvement that I had in specific events with, at those times. And so, aside from appealing directly to the Lord, each of us, um, here's a scripture I want to share with you related to how uh, a global thought and how it relates to uh, God's word for us. So I'm going to offer you excerpts from uh, Genesis 8 and 9. This is the story of Noah as many of you would know, and about the flood that covered the whole earth and destroyed all but Noah and his family. And what happened after the water receded and they were able to leave the ark. God spoke to Noah saying, come out of the ark together with your wife, your sons, and your sons' wives. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds, animals and everything that creeps on the earth and let them swarm on the earth and be fertile and increase on earth. So Noah came out together with his sons, his wife and his son's wives. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and he offered burnt offerings on the altar. The Lord smelled the pleasing odor and the Lord said to himself, never again will I doom the earth because of man since the devising of man's mind are evil from his youth, nor will I ever again destroy every living being as I have done. So long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. God further said, this is the sign that I set for the covenant between me and you and every living creature with you for all ages to come. I have set my bow in the clouds and it shall serve as a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring the clouds over the earth and the bow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and every living creature among all flesh, so that the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh.
When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and then proclaim my God. time when I was thinking about a scripture passage to share with you. And I realized, while I can talk about the Christian tradition, it isn't hard to find a message of hope, which is ultimately why we're gathered here today. So this is a reading from the first letter of the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians. Now I am going to tell you a mystery. Not all of us shall fall asleep, but all of us are to be changed in an instant, the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trumpet. The trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This corruptible body must be clothed with incorruptibility, this mortal body with immortality. When the corruptible frame takes on incorruptibility and the mortal immortality, then will the saying of Scripture be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and sin gives its power from the law. But thanks be to God who has given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Just some brief words. I found a quote that I think sums up for me my feelings about our gathering today. Every parting, a foretaste of death, every reunion, a hint of the resurrection. When I look around and I see all these loving people gathered together to honor individuals who we have lost, individuals we know we love. It tells me what a blessing those individuals have been in our lives, in our communities, and that now we're here to bless them. So as we go away together, um, and we carry in our hearts Molly and Patrick and Michael, we carry their memories with us. Let's remember that the sting of death has been defeated. And just by being here today, gathered together in fellowship and faith, is proof to that. It's a testament to our faith and to the love they shared with all of us. Amen. Please join in singing the next hymn. It's in your program. Um, if you didn't get one, hopefully, well, you can't share. Sorry. Uh, maybe there's some more around here. But it's Amazing Grace, we're doing um, the traditional first two verses in the last verse.
blessings of our Lord to each of you all. Can you hear me okay? Great. We greet you in the name that is above every name, our Lord and Savior, and we speak into your lives the holy word peace. I want to say to each of you all, it is a tremendous honor for me to stand here today to eulogize uh, Marlene Thompson. I see uh, before us we have the picture of three giants, three individuals that were loved here. But it is my privilege and honor to speak on behalf of Marlene Thompson. I'm not going to be long. We appreciate each and every one who has gathered here. It is to me so significant to see such an outpour of love and appreciation for one's co-workers. And I just, if, if it's possible, if it's possible, you don't have to touch your neighbor, you don't have to say anything to your friend, but if we could just give a round of applause for these three giants. Come on, that's good. to bring in a holy scripture that I think captures the character of Marlene. One verse in the book of Proverbs, chapter 31, verse 10. It simply says this. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is above rubies. I so appreciate this particular scripture because it is so descriptive so defining of who Marlene really was. I had a special relationship with her. Of course, she was a member of our church there in Faith Center, church there in Meriden, Connecticut. Uh, but we had a special bond. I actually knew her for many, many years, long before she was a member of our church. In fact, she was a teenager, I do believe, uh, not married at the time. And she showed and demonstrated so much promise and I have always been proud of her. Uh, those from my church, and I see a few of them here, family, uh, we appreciate you so much. But you all know, that know me, understand that those that I really appreciate and love, I have a fondness and a proclivity to joke with. And so many of them that are here would know that often when she would come past me, I was always trying to stick my foot out to try and lovingly trip her. But it was in love. And she would see that foot out and all she would laugh and her famous words were, <laughs> oh, Bishop. <laughs> and then she would try and get everyone to look to see what the Bishop was trying to do to her. And so I say that to say that I had a special fondness uh, with her. Certainly we do honor her some of those of the immediate family here, they were the first line of blessings that received her love and her attention. And so we appreciate you for being here. There's a saying that show me your friends. And I say, show me your friends and your family and I will prophesy your future. And so from that perspective, she came from a great family and she has a great family support system. And so they're going to continue to do well to the glory of God. Thank God for them. And so I wanted to say that I've chosen this particular scripture, Proverbs chapter uh, 31, verse 10, uh, specifically, because I think that it so appropriately demonstrates the character and the nature of Mother Marlene Thompson. Now we call her in our church, Mother Marlene Thompson. It is a title and a position of distinction, not just given out freely, but she was actually consecrated to that office, if I may say so. And only specific people uh, would receive that. It is a position of honor, as I said, and great respect, and one for the women to emulate, to imitate. And she was an excellent example of that. But if I were to give this a title today, I would uh, entitle it, the life of a virtuous woman. That is what the scripture is talking about, and that is who she is or who she was. The word virtuous actually uh, is used by the, by the writer of the Proverbs here 
to define, it is to defined as a woman who lives and demonstrates a holy lifestyle. That was Marlene Thompson. And I'm sure that each of you would agree that you came in contact with her. But not just a holy lifestyle, but also had a divine passion to please God. You can't have a divine passion to please God and it not spill over on those that are around you, those that you care about, those that you encounter. And so I think that everyone here can probably attest to that. The awkward truth of all of this is that in being here this day, there is no way that in a few short minutes, and I will be a few short minutes, or even if we took a day, there is no word, no way that we could put sufficient words together to actually describe and demonstrate what a great and awesome purpose, uh, excuse me, per person that she was. She was loving to all, integral, and caring. And I'm confident to say that, that those ethics uh, illuminated through her even on her job. Marlene's determination and passion uh, made her a great warrior. Yes, I said warrior. She was a warrior because she stood up and she spoke up for what she believed was right. I saw it not only in our church, but also in her home life, around family and friends and in her community. And so I'm confident to say that you all saw that truth visibly on the job. She stood up for what was right, was not afraid. I feel it is important that I not only mention uh, the importance of well I don't want you just to know how can I say put it this way I want you to know not only who she was but who she was not who she was not was she was not afraid of anything or anybody Number two, she was not a complainer. And the re these things stood out to me. And the reason that these were her traits was because she knew her God. That word knew is interesting because from this standpoint, it meant to have an intimate relationship with God. Who you knew as Marlene had an intimate and real relationship with God. That alone would set her apart from others. Perhaps we said that she was not a complainer. Perhaps many of you did not know that she endured cancer because she was not a complainer. But she fought the good fight. And in the process of fighting cancer and many other things that occurred in her life, she showed the rest of us how we are to walk by faith and not simply by sight. How we are to endure contradiction and confronting matters that challenge us as a warrior. And even as we talk about the virtuous woman, if you were to continue to read down even to the 31st verse of that particular chapter, it describes the virtuous woman having many different qualities. They're industrious, they don't give up, they're loving, they're compassionate and passionate about what they do. This is who she was. This is absolutely who she was. She endured hard times. A virtuous woman, we said, was industrious. One of the things that stick out, everyone loved Marlene, but she was also industrious. Many of you may not have known that she had a business called Marlene's Hands. Whatever Marlene put her hands to do, it was successful. She was creative with her hands, certainly in our church. She would be responsible for all of the decoration. If someone was to get married, they wanted her to, to set up everything, to you know put things in place. She was creative, and her creative ability also caused her to be a great problem solver. And if she didn't have the answers, she knew where to go to get the answers from, from her God, and God knew her. Marlene, and I'm going to close on this, 
Marlene, if I could say this, and, and I don't mean to be political, but I do mean to be correct. Marlene was the personification of the phrase that we often hear now, Black Lives Matter. And I say that with such pride and enthusiasm because may you, I, I know that you all may not have noticed, but she was black. I don't want to startle anyone. Her life made the difference wherever she was. But she also served as a role model to the young women and even to the young men of our church, to the older women that were also considered mothers. They would look at her and watch how she would do things. She was admired. She was appreciated. And we're so grateful and blessed the more because we encountered her in her life. Yes, Black Lives Matter. She made a difference in face of the church. She made a difference on her street and in her city in Waterbury. She made a difference. Do you all still call this Southbury Training School? Yes. Okay. She made a difference in Southbury Training School. And for that, we are grateful for the encounter. God bless each and every one of you. We thank God for her coming into our lives. And we thank God for the others that we're honoring today. God bless each of you. Hello, my name is Judy. I am proud to say that Patrick Carlos was my uncle. Um, he worked here at Southbury for over 30 years. Um, many of you may also know my mother, Betty Burnett. She also worked here. Um, Patrick loved to play cards and he also loved to go fishing. Um, he was always trying to get together a group here to go deep sea fishing. He was a generous man who always gave his time to good causes. He loved to help people out. He loved his family and he took very good care of his parents. He was a gentle, caring man with a big smile and a hearty laugh. Over the years, Patrick worked in several cottages in various positions. He enjoyed being a recce and taking the residents here um, on day trips, especially when they went to the Big E and to Camp Harkness. He was very fun to be with and always told great stories. I know that his family, friends, and everyone who worked with him will never forget him. I'm sure gonna miss that big guy. So on behalf of my family and myself, we would like to thank you for having this memorial. I know that my uncle would have been very touched by this event. Thank you. Michael Mark was a gentleman that uh, Father Tom and I knew not necessarily, I'll speak for me, not necessarily that well, but we do remember seeing him in a place we like to visit, uh, 41 Upper. And uh, I know that over, over his time, which began uh, here at the training school in January of 1998, he worked in not only in 41 Upper, but Cottage 9, 18, and 7. He was always described by his coworkers as committed and dedicated. Michael had a strong faith in God. He was a man that relied on his faith and his relationship with Jesus to get him through times of trouble. His co-workers have fond memories of Michael loving to gaze to the heavens and watch the stars. He was on the third shift staff, so he often was in a position on his breaks to go out and gaze up at the heavens and point out particular stars to his co-workers. His love of the stars made such a lasting impression on his co-workers that they purchased the star in the sky and named it Michael Mark. I don't know if we look up if we could figure out which one it is, but uh, that, could, that could be a challenge, I think. Psalm 147 says, He heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. 
He counts the stars and calls them all by name. How great is our God. His power is absolute. His understanding beyond comprehension. A little of Michael's background. Michael was born in Trinidad in 1953. As I, I spent over 20 years here at the training school, leaving behind some children, uh, a daughter, Cheryl, uh, a sister, Joan, a brother, Savio, and three grandchildren, as well as many nieces and nephews. He was a proud, loving father. He was fun and a great provider. His children are left with many fond memories of him. He's very intellectual and multiple degrees, including one in criminal justice and one in forensic science. He spoke multiple languages, including English, Spanish, Mandarin, and Gaelic. He was a mixed martial artist. Good thing I didn't get in trouble with him. He competed in tournaments around the globe. He had a pure love of that. He will always be remembered for his smile and his love. So we're going to sing an STS favorite. Please join in in singing I'll Fly Away. Uh, I don't know if Michelle is here or Rhonda, but uh, you know how great I play piano, so let's sing really loud. <laughs>
Good afternoon, everyone. We've heard so many scriptures this afternoon, but as I was sitting there reflecting, I began to think about Romans 8 and 28 that says, and we know that all things work together for the good. And although I can tell you all firsthand that this, that we're going through, my family and I, does not feel good, but I know that it is indeed working for my good. And so with that said, uh, my hope is in Jesus. My trust is in Jesus. My faith is strong, and I'm believing that God will continue to carry us through. This season of our lives has uh, indeed been one that is uh, just, I don't believe I know an English word to adequately describe it, but here we are. And so uh, I won't spend too much time there, but was not prepared to um, greet you all this afternoon, but I just want to say thank you to Mr. Harvey and to the entire South Bay Training School family. Can we give it up for South Bay Training School? said on behalf of my family and I have so many faces that I've uh, seen today that have known me most of my life. I remember coming here as a very young child for the bring your child to work day and just so many different things, the Christmas parties. And uh, when I remember when the farm was, was redone and opened up and just so many things come to mind as I'm sitting here reflecting on my mom's uh, tenure here. One thing that I can say emphatically is that my mom indeed loved South Bay Training School. Um, and I believe that she was certainly someone who showed her love for each and every one of you. I have down through the years heard so many stories of her love for uh, the guys and for the staff and just so many things, um, you know, that she had done here and how she was uh, indeed happy to be here. And she looked forward to uh, being here and spending all of my life here with you. I'm 33 years old and she's been here all of my life. And so I'm just grateful for each and every one of you. I'm grateful that you all have decided to include her and to uh, think it necessary to honor her life. Uh, that kind of pretty much speaks for itself. And so I'm grateful again to everybody, thankful for my family who has been right by, uh, by our side. My brother, I believe you all know my brother who is, he does work at Southbridge Training School, Bryce. So I'm grateful for him and just for everybody, thankful for my pastor who is here sharing with us today. And all of you. So I would ask that you all would continue to keep us in prayer, keep us in your thoughts and concerns as we navigate through this very uncertain season that we're in. But one thing, as I said, for sure that we know that God will see us through. Thank you. Thank you, Frankie. Thank you. As we prepare to... Uh, close and then there'll be a final uh, final song for us. I wanted to share part of this poem and then um, I'm going to read to you something you probably know about of uh, something called the Kaddish Jewish tradition but if you've heard it ever you've always heard it chanted in Hebrew. I want to offer you the um, tra a translation uh, of it, and then uh, Tom and, and uh, Bishop uh, Joseph are going to come up here, and uh, we, the three of us are going to do the Our Father together, and we hope you'll join us. Dear God, may these measures of the quarantine be successful in stemming the tide, in slowing transmission, in helping this epidemic run its course. Dear God, spur us to take swift action, inspire us to do what we can for those who are more vulnerable than we. Help us to transcend the false divisions of clean and unclean, symptom-free and symptomatic, healthy and sick, inside and outside the camp. May we let this virus teach us just how interconnected we all really are. Dear God, lifter of the fallen, healer of the sick, redeemer of the bound, the one who commands us all to wash our hands. Now the Kaddish. Exalted and hallowed be God's great name in the world which God created according to plan. May God's majesty be revealed in the days of our lifetime in the life of all of us speedily, imminently, to which we say, Amen. Blessed be God's great name to all eternity. Blessed, praised, honored, exalted, extolled, glorified, adored, and lauded 
be the name of the Holy Blessed One, beyond all earthly words and songs of blessing, praise, and comfort, to which we say, Amen. May there be abundant peace from heaven and life for us all, to which we say, Amen. May the one who creates harmony on high bring peace to us and to all, to which we say, Amen. Pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And reveal us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you turn over the first page of the flyer that you got, there's a prayer there. It's called, We Remember. In the rising of the sun, please join me. In the rising of the sun and it's going down, we remember them. In the blowing of the wind and in the chill of winter, we remember them. In the opening of the buds and in the rebirth of spring, we remember them of the skies and in the warmth of summer, we remember them. In the rustling of the leaves and the beauty of autumn, we remember them. In the beginning of the year and when it ends, we remember them. When we are weary and in need of strength, we remember them. When we are lost and sick of heart, we remember them. When we have joys and special celebrations we yearn to share, we remember them. As long as we live, Marlene, Patrick, and Michael, too, shall live, for they are now a part of us as we remember them. Thank you. 
Craig and I don't know. Did you want to introduce the ones? Here? It's in the program. <laughs> okay. And, and, uh, so I thank you all for coming, and I thank uh, Eugene and, and the other staff for putting this together for all of us. God bless. Yeah.